Welcome everyone. Uh, this is the, the third and last lecture of a spring lecture series. And we are still uh, under the, this main thematic uh, um, approach on healing environments. And, and the, the subtitle of that, of that um, main theme is very intentional, is landscapes and architecture after the crisis. Today, we're going to have actually a landscape uh, architect giving a lecture, which is, I think, is the first one during this semester. And it's going to be Diane, Allen, uh, Diane Jones Allen, and it's going to be our um, landscape and our, uh, uh, assistant professor of landscape architecture, Matt Nicolet, who's going to be introducing her, who was the one that invited her also. So, Matt, please. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, it's a little loud. Um, just give me a couple of moments to uh, talk a little bit about Diane's background. Um, Director Jones Allen is the program director for landscape architecture in the College of Architecture, Planning, and Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Arlington, um, as well as a practicing landscape architect and principal and principal and principal of Design Jones. Um, oh, there it's back. Sorry, principal of Design Jones, a firm that is adept at tying together neighborhood empowerment, disaster recovery, and innovative planning and design. Dr. Allen holds a fine arts from Washington University in St. Louis, a master of landscape architecture from UC Berkeley, and a doctorate in engineering, majoring in civil engineering with a concentration in transportation from Morgan State University. She's received many awards, honors, and fellowships, including the 2016 ASLA Community Service Award, the 2020 SOM Research Fellowship, and the 2021 Dunbarn Oaks Research Fellowship in Garden and Landscape Studies. She was elevated to an ASLA Fellow in 2019. Diane has established a national, rep national reputation by bridging practice and research, sorry, by bridging practice and research specifically in the areas of transportation access, sustainability, and environmental justice. Her research and practice are guided by the intersection of environmental justice, identity, and sustainability in cultural landscapes, including nomadic responses to transit deserts. Her work has led to many publications, including the book Lost in Transit Desert, uh, Race, Transit, Access, and Suburban Form. Uh, she's also recently published an article related to her research at Dumbark and Oates, uh, Living Freedom Through the Maroon Landscape and Places Journal. Uh, on a personal note, uh, I would have the opportunity to work with uh, Diane. She offered me my first teaching position in landscape architecture as an adjunct teaching professional practice. Um, I was able to sit on several reviews, mostly virtual, with Diane, and I'm always inspired by the way she encouraged students to look deeper into the research and to engage the proper stakeholders. Um, that led for more memorable and authentic projects. Um, so I, I learned quite a bit from Diane, so I'm very happy she agreed to come here today. And please help me in welcoming uh, Diane uh, <coughs> Jones Allen. Thank you, Matt, and um, for your graciousness. <laughs> and um, thank all of you faculty and students for having me. Uh, and, and I hope um, after I go through the work, which is uh, mainly work of my practice, um, that um, we can have a good discussion. Um, I look forward to that. So um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uh, design for healing. Um, particularly the wounds of inequity and injustice. So uh, I feel that landscape architecture is um, one of the main ways that uh, vulnerable communities can shape the places that they live in and make a difference. Um, and that's why I choose landscape architecture. <laughs> it's my chosen profession because uh, I want to make a difference in the world. Um, so uh, I'm going to show, I think, five projects um, that have kind of different themes. Uh, this one is uh, Martin Luther King Memorial Walk, uh, and it's about healing a cultural divide. This uh, 
is Martin Luther King Boulevard and Aretha K. So Haley. Yeah. Martin Luther King Boulevard project sites right there. And uh, it's in a neighborhood post Katrina that went through gentrification. And I'll talk a little more about gentrification. So I have no problem with revitalization. Um, I think that, uh, um, you know, the word gentrification is very layered and uh, packed, so the different aspects of it are not all negative, <laughs> right? Bringing new businesses, redevelopment is really important, and often those impacted by those want those things, but they want to be included. I think that's where you get in the trouble with uh, displacement or um, people not being included. So this neighborhood, and so the wound here really was not the quote unquote gentrification, it was the displacement, not being included. So this neighborhood is uh, right, um, I would say west of, so New Orleans is weird, you can't really say north and west because that's why it's the Crescent City, it sits in a curve, right? So people usually say, you know, river to lake. <laughs> So it sits lakeside of the downtown, um, and it's an old neighborhood. And so post Katrina, a lot of money came into it, um, including um, capital in, in investment. So uh, the, the city or the state gave the city and federal government a bunch of money, which they put into new streets and road improvement, which made developers and other people come in. And uh, this is just some of the example, uh, a new jazz market, which is a really nice place. <laughs> they have really good jazz. And, um, and then uh, there was a new food and beverage museum. And then private development, renovation of homes. Um, so you know, can new development be inclusive? Uh, so this project, that little square I showed you, was uh, the Aretha I mean, not the Aretha Castle, yes, the Aretha Castle Haley Merchants Association, because new merchants was, were coming in, they wanted to continue the open space improvement, and so they wanted to turn this square and re revitalize it, and they got a, a grant from um, the New Orleans Redevelopment Authority, who got state money. Um, and so there are two different kind of groups. No community is a monolith, right? So there was uh, one group of, of new merchants and new residents, and you know this is the kind of stuff we all know. If you're landscape architects, you know who Jane Jacobs is. And so the idea of Jane Jacobs is really great. I mean, this is now a walkable community with eyes on the street and retail <laughs> on the bottom and you know all the things that you want. But there was an old community who used the space and the neighborhood differently. So I really love this because um, real, recreating the environmental ability to live. <laughs> that's the name of this group, which I'm all, I think that's wonderful, I'm all for that. And uh, they actually, every year, do like a march protest on Martin Luther King's actual birthday, not the fake birthday that we do on the 19th <laughs> for, to fit in with our you know, calendar, but his real birthday on the 15th. Um, and so this is what they do in this space. So there were two visions for this space. One vision was we want a nice, you know, kind of park, pocket park. And the other vision was we want a place to protest. So how do you deal with that? So the first thing you have to do is get all these diverse groups to come together. Um, and, uh, you know, the Merchants Association, the Gulf Coast Housing, Ashe Culture Center, which is a big community-based cultural organization, real, the people of the community, you know, how do you get them together? When this, this project went out through RFP, Request for Proposal, I guess you all are taking, um, yeah, uh, pro practice, so you know RFPs and RFQs. And so um, we won the RFP, and in the scope of work, there was no community engagement because the city had given the land, the state had given the money, and the um, uh, Merchants Association was the administrator 
you know, and they just wanted us to come in and start designing. And we said, no. <laughs> we said, we must engage these diverse groups. So um, basically, it was, you know, basically telling them that if you want this place to be stewarded and taken care of, and um, then we must get everybody kind of in consensus. So they, they then agreed and put that in the scope of work. So the first thing we always do is look at the history. Because history and culture are really important for making design. You know, it's like that cliche, but it's true. You can't know where you're going until where you've been. So it's always the place I start. I always look backwards before I start thinking forward. And this place had an interesting history. It actually was a immigrant neighborhood, Germans, Jew, Jewish people, and Italians. And but they allowed blacks one of the few places to work as musicians. You know, uh, they also allowed it was one of the few places at that time where black people could shop. Um, uh, and um, later on. Uh, you know, with change, Aretha Castle Haley, who the street's named after, she was a member of SNCC, Student Nonviolent um, Coordinating Committee. Uh, if you know your black history research, you know SNCC. <laughs> your civil rights, you know SNCC. Um, so uh, she worked to, in, to further integrate and make sure that blacks weren't just patrons, they became owners. And uh, after years, of course, the, without then capital investment, the com community started to kind of deteriorate until this new influx post-Katrina. Uh, the guy in the middle is uh, Frank Hayden, who is um, the artist of the sculpture. So in uh, 1970, it's either 76 or 72, you could see uh, Mayor Landrew, the first Mayor Landrew, Moon Layer Man Landrew, later we had Mitch Landrew of New Orleans, is dedicating this sculpture. And um, so this site, you know, had been designed. Um, and at first, uh, the community wanted a sculpture of Martin Luther King. So when this was unveiled, they had a fit. It kind of reminds me, I don't know, you guys are young, different generations. So you might not have seen Beetlejuice. But if you've seen Beetlejuice, there's this kind of hand-looking sculpture. It reminds me of the Beetlejuice thing. <laughs> but believe it or not, you know, the community was horrified. But now they love it. They embrace it. They call it the abstract. So in this new renovation, they wanted it to stay. And there's another reason why they wanted it to stay. So the first thing we always like to do is I always believe that, because I always get this question sometimes, you know, um, people will say, well, Diane, do you believe, you know, only black people can work in black communities? Or, you know, I said, no. I believe that anybody can work in any community. It's just that we come with our skills and you have to come with your ears, right? You just have to realize what you don't know and what you do bring. And so in that vein, you know, we don't like usually bring people in a big room. We eventually do that. But one of the first things we like to do is walk the site with the community because that gets them to loosen up and talk and they become the experts, right? Because they live there every day. So they walk around with you and they say, oh, this is where that happens and this is where that happens, right? So we always do that. So in this case, we brought the diverse groups onto the site so they could kind of talk to each other and talk to us about how they envision the site and what it would be. And then another thing we do, a community is not a monolith, so you have to have multiple kinds of engagement. So the on-site engagement, and then target engagement. So there was a senior uh, citizen home right across the street. So we actually took the engagement there because you know they you, often you have to go to people when they can't get out. You can't expect everyone to come to a meeting at five o'clock, right? Um, so we did that. And then we brought everybody back together, and I really like circles. I actually do that in my class. I drive the students crazy because I always make them take their chairs and put them in a circle. <laughs> because I think circles are really egalitarian, especially when you have diverse groups. And then I, we also had people take pictures um, when they were on the site. So then they could share with each other, like of the different groups, well, I saw this and I think that, right? It's, the cell phone's great. And everyone has one these days, rich and poor. Everybody has one, so I'm like, use a cell phone. Um, so we did, you know, we brought people together. 
And then the next thing we did is we came up with three schemes, and we came back, and we actually did a survey to have them choose which scheme they liked based on, you know, the things that they had said that they wanted, right? Seating, lighting, planting, gathering space. They wanted to keep the sculpture, um, recognizing Frank Hayden, uh, recognizing Martin Luther King. Um, and so people took, chose scheme number two. So this is scheme number two. Unfortunately, and this happens a lot, well, not a lot, <laughs> but sometimes. So the original scheme had this cutout, um, which th there's water everywhere under New Orleans, okay? So old New Orleans had a, was canal, it was like Venice. And so there's a canal that runs under here, you know? So it's running from the river all the way through to Lake Pontchartrain, there's a, a, a canal. Um, so we suggested punching a hole, right, in there so that people could know they were above water. Because often, because of the levees and because of everything being, all the canals being covered up, people forget in New Orleans, you are 20 feet below water and then there's water under you. So we really wanted to do that. But believe it or not, the city said yes and um, the sewage and water board said yes, but the client, said no because they were worried about maintenance and they were worried about the glass, even though, you know, the glass is fine, right? Um, as Matt said today, there's glass over the Grand Canyon. <laughs> so, um, so, but, so we ended up just, you know, not being able to punch. We actually didn't put anything in there because we're still trying to fight. We had them actually seam it so that once they agree, we can go back and punch that out. Because I just think it makes a difference in the design to be able to look and understand your overwater. Okay, so this was the opening and um, everybody came. And as you could see, it's a really good site for protest and because we took out that fountain and now you can walk up and you can look in and see, because before there, this, this set in the fountain, so you actually couldn't see the quotes in the sculpture. And we took away all that, those shrubs to open it up because now the site becomes the whole street, as you could see. You know, now you can have marches in the street and New Orleans people live in the street. There's always a second line or a jazz funeral or a march. So we opened that up so people could use this plaza like uh, a place to like view the activity in the street. Um, and then this, you know, we said, okay, the people that wanted, you know, that both communities should have what they want. So now the other, the new community that want to have little music venues and, you know, a nice place just to sit together, they can also use the space. It's like a really flexible space now for everybody. Um, and uh, one great thing is now you can go up here and she's reading the quotes. So in here are quotes from... Um, Martin Luther King's um, uh, dream speech. Uh, one issue we had was because of the narrowness of the site, we weren't able to ramp up. So in terms of ADA, you have to provide, if you provide one activity for one group, you have to provide that activity for the other group. So the way we satisfied that was we took the quotes out. And so all the quotes that are in here are on these floating concrete benches. So now if I'm in a wheelchair, I can read what she's reading. Yeah. Okay, so the next project is about, um, oh, look at that, somehow that thing is off, um, healing through reclamation of community-focused culture and history. Uh, so it's about reclaiming the culture and the history of a place and using that to move forward um, and so the wound here is infrastructure. And every time I see this, I want to cry, and I've seen it a hundred times. So this is Treme. I don't know if any of you watch the HBO series Treme on HBO. It's still running. <laughs> um, and that series actually, post-Katrina, between the people coming to help and then falling in love, uh, and then also uh, that series Treme, a lot of uh, new people moved on this side of the freeway. So a lot of quote unquote gentrification or new residents 
So the property values went up. But anyway, way back in the 70s, this became this. This is the same exact location. This was the longest stand of oak trees. And I'm not telling you a story, because when I say this, people say, you can look it up. It's a fact. This was the longest stand of oak trees, trees in North America. It was a double LA. It also basically was a linear park. So instead of being a divider, it brought the community together, because people came there at Mardi Gras. They came to Second Line. They came to hang out, right? So this got dropped. Um, and here you can see it. It was amazing. Just like a double LA that went for, you know, miles. <laughs> um, and this is when they were, um, you know, starting to remove it. And you could see the beautiful, I mean, New Orleans has such wonderful architecture. So this is what lined that, these beautiful houses. But those houses are gone because this happened. It went from that to that. And what happened is you can also see in that first image how it de-densified. So you could see those houses went. A lot of them had to go because of the construction, because of all the environmental issues that happened with now happening, having all that carbon and bad air and noise. Um, so you can see, yeah. So a lot of those wonderful houses are gone. Other things came. And then there's still a lot of vacancy. You also can see. Mm. Oops. Oh, sorry. You also can see in this slide kind of some tree paintings on these columns because the community actually have claimed the space. So that'll come back later. So this basically lets you kind of know the zoning. So it's residential on both sides of this. So this thing like dropped through a residential community. Um, so there were previous plans. In 1976, Perkins and James, which is um, a very groundbreaking, one of the first African-American architecture firms in New Orleans, they did this study. And their idea was to actually put building shops underneath the freeway. Of course, that didn't come to fruition. In 2013, there was a plan, and we actually, that was done by Goody Clancy and Kittleson, um, and you could see Design Jones. We were a sub, we were a local subconsultant. And the interesting thing about this plan was, um, and, it, and it had different scenarios, right? Um, so it had, uh, you know, some places where you just take it down, um, then some scenarios where you would just take down the ramps putting the streetcar. So um, you know, the plan did kind of advocate for the removal and then re, you know, imagining this. But there was pushback from the community. And um, I would ask you, why do you think there would be pushback from the community with taking down that horrible freeway? Well, anybody want to tell me why there would be pushback from the community? No? OK. We'll talk about it later if you're thinking about it. There was pushback because it was already gentrifying on one side. And they were feeling like, if you take it down, and there had been some other schemes that other people had done showing it becoming a um, daylighting the canal and showing it become a lovely boulevard with a daylighting canal. But the problem with a daylighted canal, you can't second line in a canal, right? can't do a jazz funeral in a canal, right? It's beautiful and environmental, but you can't do the social cultural things that they did. So the community was like, uh, maybe we don't want it down. Or maybe you want to claim the space before we take it down. Because I do think they want it down, but it's just the fear of what will happen if they're not really included. So in 2017, uh, two uh, African-American women. Um, they became the uh, Claiborne Corridor Cultural Innovation um, District. Uh, they got a grant, helped the city get a grant, to actually look at you know, what can we do to claim this space before it comes down. And um, this, they hired, so uh, to, to do the engagement, they hired uh, Brian Lee. Do you know him? If you don't, you should look him up. He's a lot much older than you guys. Hot young architect. He just he won the Cooper Hewitt. He has a firm called Colligate, and he really does design justice. 
So they hired him to do this report, and he did this like series of engagements, even over the summer. Um, and actually, I was in one of the panels he had in July, right there. Um, and uh, so he did this really strong community engagement. And so then the uh, city put out an RFQ to actually take that and design the 19, 19 blocks. Um, and in the report, there were some community tenants that are really important, utilizing human capital as the main investment for project development. And I, I would say you should do that on any project. <laughs> Build strength, strengthen the coalitions based on environment, environmentally sound development and preservation values. Because environmental issues are really important here, like you know, keeping up the freeway, keeping the freeway up really does have environmental impact. You know, because um, it's not healthy, causing issues. So, how do you keep it up for a period while they're waiting to take it down, and you know, deal with some of that? But that's another. No matter what project I'm working on, that's another value. But this came out of that engagement. Um, so, we also wanted to look at, um, you know, another thing was looking at New Orleans. You know, um, like culture and history and its architectural cues. And New Orleans is pretty amazing because, you know, it was French, then Spanish, then French again, and then English, right? It became part of America. So that's why it's like this. And then it was Arcadian. It was Canadians came down because they got kicked out, you know, French got kicked out of Canada, and so you, that's where you get the Cajuns. And then because of um, you know, the slave trade, you got uh, a whole influx of Africans from Senegambia, and then also from the, the French and Spanish slave colonies of uh, you know, Haiti and uh, you know, that came up from Central um, and America and the Caribbean. So that's why it's such a gumbo. And then, I mean, I was arguing this when, uh, my partner, um, design Austin, said, put Morocco. I was like, OK, now come on. So because the Africans that came to New Orleans came from Semi-Gambia, which is West Coast, Senegal, and Gambia. And he was saying, oh, no, there's Moorish architecture here. And he said, see? And he kept showing. I said, well, where did that come from? And I did some research when I was at Dumbarton Oaks. And believe it or not, a whole slew of people from Morocco came to New Orleans. So that's where you get this. So it's pretty amazing. Let's see. I mean, I don't want to jump. OK, so yeah, so that's pretty cool. Anyway, we want to connect the green infrastructure, because as you could see, there was a canal that runs under there. And then today, they built the Lafitte Greenway. And most importantly, we wanted to make sure there was entrepreneurship, because the young people in New Orleans, I mean, that's where you get trombone shorty and Wynton Marcellus and all this. You know, they, they grow up blowing a trumpet. And they're very entrepreneurial um, in all kinds of ways, and even visual arts. So we really wanted to make sure that that was part of it. Uh, and so these were just some precedents. And so then we came up with this 19-block uh, um, divided into uh, four cultural, kind of four themes, the Garden of the Moors, because we really wanted to deal with that environmental issue, back of town, um, tambourine and fan. Uh, there's a lot of pop-up markets that happen under there, you'll see. And then we really wanted a place for the youth and then kind of commercial area, the spirit circle. And so here we said we would, you know, using that Moorish theme, we would uh, collect the water, because there are like gallons of water that come off the freeway, and we would collect it and capture it in these kind of cisterns that, um, you know, uh, run under. Uh, and then we would filter it before it went to Lake Pontchartrain, and then we also would use it for irrigation. Um, and that's more of the Garden of the Moors. And then this I really love. You know, so I always ask this question about who do you think are the most discriminated people in open space? And people give me all kinds of things. They'll say the elderly, you know, 
or you know, all kinds, you know, African Americans or all kinds of stuff. But my answer are is teenagers. Nobody wants teenagers, and we were all teenagers. You were teenagers, don't forget it. But they're always saying, put spikes so the teenagers can't skateboard. The teenagers are hanging out. Every client, we don't want the teenagers. So we said, this is only for the teenagers. So, whoops. So anybody between 12 and 21, if you're older or younger than that, you can't come. <laughs> so we said, they can skateboard, they can you know, play basketball. I mean, I've had so many projects where they said, we don't want a basketball court. You'll bring the teenagers. You know, it's like teenagers, like everyone was, one was. I know they're crazy. It's a period when you're crazy, but you know, they have a right to be in public space. Um, uh, and that was that last spirit circle. And then these are just some, you know, and a formal market, because right now they already do these pop-up markets under there. So we want to continue to make them happen. And then uh, we wanted to like really, you know, plant to, you know, kind of soften and capture water, buffer some of the carbon. Um, and so this picture, believe it or not, is not with any design. We haven't done anything. This project just went out to bid phase um, 1A and 1B, just went out to bid last week. This is what happens already authentically. And so that's kind of the, you know, my wish is that we didn't over-design, that we don't take away the spontaneity because we're, you know, doing form making. So you, sometimes that can happen. We want to make sure that people still come and do this, right? And so when this happened, we used it for engagement. So this is how we presented the plan. We didn't bring them to a hall. We didn't send, we actually put it under the freeway which I thought was really great. It's like going to where people are, and then people could actually look at it and then walk down and say, oh, that's where that's happening. Or that's not, shouldn't happen there because we do this there, right? So we did that in schematic and got feedback on the site and then came back and ended up doing the construction documents. So the next project is about, it's a public housing development in DC, and it's about, healing through environment and claiming public space uh, using green stormwater infrastructure. Uh, so uh, Langston Terrace is in DC. It's um, in the Anacostia watershed. Uh, it's a mainly African-American community um, and, you know, female-headed households. You know, uh, those are, you know, the statistics, a lot of young people. Um, and then same thing, we looked at the history, and most of the residents didn't know that it was designed by Paul Williams, who's African American. So that's one of the things we really want to incorporate in the signage on the site, um, to give them like a kind of a sense of pride about the place that they're living in. And actually the units are nice, but the units were being renovated, so how we got this job is they were renovating these units, and they are, they're not, it's not one of those tall stack things, they don't really make those anymore. Um, these are, you know, kind of, uh, you know, little townhouse-like, um, but they're really, really old, and in the renovation, they were giving them washer and dryers and air condition. So because they gave them washer and dryers, they realized, DCA said, oh my gosh, we don't need all this. So there is miles and miles of asphalt and these hangars. So they said, okay, we should get a landscape architect. So we got this job to decide what to do with all this available open space and all this terrible asphalt and bad runoff. And um, so uh, working with an engineer, we took this down. Actually, there are going to be cells to capture water under here. Um, so we did engagement. And we did our tried and true because we don't live in you know, this neighborhood. So we said, walk us around. <laughs> so they walked us around. It was really great because they were telling us how, you know, the students, their kids have to climb this fence to get from school because the fence isn't open. And then, you know, this person, you know, lives here, and this is what happens here, and these are the things we would like to see. So we did that, and um, this is when we went and we came back and presented uh, three schemes. 
Um, and then we came, well, we brought them back, and you could see the stickies, um, the adventure path. So basically, three kind of configurations based on you know, the things that they told us. But we brought this back, and then we ended up with you know, them giving us notes on that, and then going away, and then coming back again with the things that they asked for. The things that they asked for. I do something? Oh, oh, hold on. My battery's running low. Is there a way I can plug in my laptop up here? <laughs> that would be terrible. Here. Oh, there's one right behind you. Oh, cool. Oh, yes. Now, is this working again? Yay. OK. So this was the um, site plan, basically based on the things that they wanted. Um, and basically, you know, they wanted bigger front porches. They wanted, you know, uh, some parking, even though we got rid of a lot of the parking, because they didn't really use it, because there's buses, the metro. You know, it's DC. It's very walkable. Um, we, we eliminated some of the parking. They wanted an ADA accessible garden. And that's really wonderful because we didn't think of that. They thought of that. They're like, wow, <laughs> you know? So it's really good to listen, you know, to communities because they have a lot of great ideas about what, you know, the programming. Yes, we're experts at form making, but in the programming ideas, you know, those are things that we didn't think of. So these are, you know, some renderings of, uh, you know, the changes, um, taking away parking, making sure all the spaces were permeable, um, giving them these backyards. That's an example of the, so something that was kind of, that they could, you know, you could see through, but actually gave you some cover. Uh, so we did the sports court. Um, because they kept saying, we don't want a basketball court. So we said, OK, we'll trick them. We'll give them this flex court. So you could dance on it, play basketball, do whatever you want. Um, so we want to make a place for the young people. We did a, a woodland trail. So we just basically took all that asphalt out and just made this wonderful place, um, a playground for the kids. This is, these are those um, ADA accessible garden that they wanted. You know, places just to sit. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure everyone, you know, there was planting in their yards, but lots of greens and flexible spaces for, you know, playing games, you know, large checkers, whatever, cornhole, which people seem to like. <laughs> yeah, a meditation and peaceful spaces. And these were just some precedent images. So this, that project right now is in DD, where you're actually going in and saying it's actually this. And, you know, um, and we're working with a civil engineering firm to do the um, water capturing cells under all that. Because all that stuff, the sports court, everything is permeable so that water comes in and goes in these cells. Same thing can be used for irrigation or clean before it goes to the Anacostia. So the next is about healing land and community through memory and transformation. This is the Tamir Rice Memorial. And so the wound uh, to me here is unjust environments. Places where you can go and should be safe, but you are not. <laughs> because of many external factors that you can't control, which is you know who you were born to and what you look like. Some of those things you cannot control. But uh, sometimes, because of those things, you go to in certain environments, and you are not safe. Um, so I blurred this intentionally, but I don't know if you've heard of the Tamir, Tamir Rice. There's been so many of these. It's not good. Um, so that's Tamir, and that's the police officer. So um, this is Jamie. Uh, who was approached by uh, Molly Nagan, who was working with the Tamir Rice Foundation. So Tamir uh, Rice, the case, didn't even, didn't get, um, there was no indictment. 
the police officer actually left and went to work somewhere else, believe it or not. Another jurisdiction hired him, not in Cleveland. This was in Cleveland. But she did win a civil suit, um, and she started a foundation, which was wonderful. And then she decided um, there was a pavilion in that shot. You could see the pavilion. The thing about this shot that really, <laughs> I remember seeing this on the news, and so you can't really tell where he is, right? You just see this kind of building. I kept thinking, is he downtown? Where is he? But it turns out he was here. So when I went here, I was just like shocked because there are children everywhere, see? And his sister was here. His sister went to this school, and she actually was there when he got shot, and she got thrown down by police. Her name's Tajay, and handcuffed and watched him die. So his sister was there. And so her school, her elementary school, because she was an elementary kid, built this um, butterfly garden. So when I met Ms. Rice, she actually had gotten permission from the, um, the, uh, the lynching um, museum, the, the, that peace and justice and lynching museum that's in Montgomery to use one of those, I don't know if you've seen that work, there are these hanging columns. Well, they gave her copyright that she could use one for here. So her idea was to hang one of those on a pedestal. But when I went to the site, I was like, no. <laughs> because I get the idea of a lynching. I understand how horrendous it was, but it's a place for children. And he was a child there, 12 year old, hanging out, playing. And someone called and said, it could be a child. But um, anyway, so uh, they asked Jamie to do it, but she just felt like you know there should be someone more connected to the culture. So uh, we ended up getting the job. But, we, but Jamie worked as the architect of record. So uh, she actually did the construction management because we were you know, in New Orleans and Texas. So we worked with her, and we did the design. Um, so these are like schemes I came up with, because I thought, you know, we want to keep the butterfly garden. And they wanted to keep the butterfly garden, because the students and the kids of the school had worked on it. And this kind of was the idea of, you know, black men are put in a box, but they're really butterflies. Uh, and then this was the other scheme of, you know, same thing. that you know, this butterfly morphing, morphing into a boy, and this was a piece of Corten steel, you know, that came down and cut him down, kind of symbolizing the, the death, the gunshot. Um, and so Miss Rice picked this scheme, and we changed it a bit because we put a walk, and we had a local artist actually embed butterflies and had this dry creek that goes. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's a dry creek that actually collects water that runs and feeds the butterfly garden. Um, you can see that. And that's rendering. Uh, these are material boards. Um, and so it opened on July 22nd, um, the memorial. Uh, they, it was really well attended, wonderful, and um, the family was overwhelmed, but really happy because they, re you know, Miss Rice said, you know, she realizes that having some, as opposed to having that kind of object-oriented memorial, something that kind of took over the whole space, something that was more experiential, something that was about peace and healing. So she was happy that you know she changed her mind. Um, and it kind of like kids come there and play, you know? So I, I think that it's a place that it doesn't, you know, I mean, really his, um, let's see. Oh, okay, I haven't gotten to it yet. Um, there's a, a art center right across. So you have a lot of young people, the age that he would be now, and then kids that of the age that that go to the elementary school that he was when it happened. Um, and you know, families and people that come to play. So I think it does both. It definitely says there was a death, because that to me looks like a gravestone. And we got a really great artist. That, that stone was hand etched. And I like the fact that it 
it's reflective. It looks like water, um, almost. Uh, but you know, these are young men that are his age. The other people were his age. He would be now because he would probably, he was 12. He would be 18 today. And so, you know, it's beautiful, but it is all, you know, it's a place about the pain and the loss and a place where people can, you know, it's subtle, can kind of com contemplate that. Um, and that was hand etched by uh, an artist that we had to, because we were going to have it laser. You can laser on stone, but it wipes, it comes, it'll wear off. So the hand etching, that'll never, and the artist was amazing. She did that from a photo. Um, and, the, and Tamir's mother wrote the words, and so I had to, we had to go back and forth with the city because, <laughs> you know, many drafts, because the city was like, we can't say that. You can't say that, but I loved Miss Rice. She is really strong. I mean, this was all her doing. She paid for this whole thing. She got an encroachment agreement from the city, which allowed her to put it there, but it was her. She wanted to pay for it so she could control the design. I mean, basically, we worked with for her. She could control the design. She could control, you know, how it, you know, the maintenance, all of it. So she, she was an amazing person. Um, yeah. And so, you know, there was going back and forth because she said, the amount of death of everlasting pain they have caused black America. So they were okay. There were some things she had had in there about the police we had to get rid of <laughs> and some other things. But she was able to, you know, they accepted her powerful words, you know. So good for the city of Cleveland. And as you could see, this is looking the other way. So this is that art center. It's called the Cuddle Art Center. It's just amazing to me that, it, like, if you drove up on that, it, you're in between an elementary school and an arts center. Why wouldn't a kid be there? I kept thinking in 2014, I kept thinking, well, why was he out there by himself? Why was he? But then when I, I said, oh, he was supposed to be here. He was here playing, like a zillion other kids that were there. Um, and so the last uh, one I'm going to show is the Fred Rouse Memorial. Um, do I have time, or should I skip this one? OK, um, so uh, this is in Fort Worth, Texas. And this is the same kind of wound. It's about healing a particular environment. Um, and so uh, the wound is racial terror and lynching in America. That's a wound that uh, we still suffer from, the memories of it the impacts that it had on families. So in 1927, Fred Rouse was working at a meatpacking plant. And at that time, African Americans couldn't belong to unions. And the union was striking. And the union told him, you better not go to work, but you're not going to be the beneficiary of anything that we gain out of this. So Fred Rouse was like, OK, I'm not going to be the beneficiary, so I'm going to work. So he went to work. And of course, he was accosted. Uh, you know, when he left work, and uh, they thought they left him for dead, and the police kind of said, okay, we're going to make them think that they were dead. Actually, the police are heroes in this story, because the police made the mob think he was dead, and they put him in the police car, telling the mob they're going to the morgue, but they went to the hospital. And so they basically saved his life. But then the mob somehow found out. Somebody told them that he wasn't at the morgue. He was at the hospital. And so he was uh, turned over. You know, the hospital staff turned him over to the mob. And he was lynched from this tree right there on the site. Um, so this is Fred Rouse III. You know, there's always a champion, like Miss Rice is a champion. Here's the champion. So Fred Rouse III, that was his grandfather. And the, his parents would never talk about him. Every time he would mention it, you know, his parents would be hush. So he did his own research, and he found out. And so working with the Tarrant County Peace and Justice Center, they um, decided to do a memorial. Um, so you know what guided our design? The history, which I just showed you. Engagement, you always have to do engagement. Um, and you find all kinds of different ways to do it. So we did virtual engagement, right? Because um, 
this is 2022 and you know some people still don't want to come together but you know virtual engagement we're, we're working on a project now on georgia tech's campus and we we did in person and virtual because I'm finding that you have to do multiple and virtual is a real, that's one of the good things that came out of COVID, realizing that you can do virtual engagement so you can get people who can't come. And you, do, you need to do in person too. So we did all of that and site, we're on the site, um, the groundbreaking. So these are the concept sketches, which we always like to um, show the client, the rough stuff. Um, and so these are the themes like overcoming, the experience and the legacy. Uh, so uh, we presented the three schemes, um, and this one has these core 10 panels that you would walk through to this, and a timeline you would walk through to this uh, kind of wall with a granite, with an image of Fred Rouse. So you'd walk through these trees, and these trees, you know, at first, you know, well, we change them because they're kind of fluffy. They don't, they don't really say lynching tree. Um, and actually, we got that feed. That was in our feed. This is what we designed. And with the engagement, when we showed them from the community, they said, those trees do not look like lynching. And that's really profound. It changed the design. So engagement is not just to check the box. It actually will impact your form making. Um, and this one, this actually was my favorite one, but it's not the one that got chosen. It had these footprints, and when it got to the lynching tree, the footprints turned, and it was like a ramp that goes up and down. Um, as you can see, the ramp going up, and then you go to the tree, the lynching tree, and come down. Uh, and then this other one, which was very organic, with Corten walls that had like you know the time periods of what happened to him. You can see that one. And so the first one got chosen. Uh, and the first one, we, as always, you can see they, it got modified. So we took out those fountains because we thought, you know, we, we always try to be, one of the things that we always try to do is bring in the aspect of sustainability. So you can't be talking about sustainability and have two large fountains. That takes a lot of you know, electric energy, <laughs> electricity, and mechanical, and water. So we turned those two fountains into rain gardens. And actually, they, they liked it, right? It actually made the budget go down. And it's more appropriate to, to the memorial. But everything else stayed the same except the trees. And we changed the tree, which I like so much better. And that came from the community, not us. So if you have a cell phone, you can QR on this, and you'll get a virtual. You can walk through the whole project. So if you QR this, you can do a virtual walkthrough. And I'll change after you've done it. So this is in DD. So this was chosen. This was like the final site plan. And so now we're in design development where we're actually, you know, pricing and specking <laughs> um, before we do the final construction documents. Um, although we did, um, is everybody finished? We did do the groundbreaking, so I was really excited. Um, and so, and the community's really excited about it. They're so happy that we listened to them in terms of the trees and in terms of taking out the fountains and making that more sustainable. Um, but, you know, everything else, they're very happy. Uh, and that's me being very proud <laughs> of my work. Um, and yeah, and, and they really like the QR thing. And actually, this was a young person in our office who actually, uh, Angeles Margarita, was one of uh, Matthew's students. Because <laughs> he asked me about her, is she doing well? I'm like, she's doing fantastic because, you know, I'm an old person. I had no idea that you could do that. And she put that on there. She said, look, you can, we can have a walkthrough. So um, it's an impact you can make in an office. Yeah. So, uh, and, uh, and then here was the, uh, the ground healing ceremony. And actually, that's why they, what they called it. So that's why I'm ending with this. Because landscape can heal. 
You know, this is healing for Fred Rouse and his family. This is healing for the community. This is healing for Fort Worth. You know, this is healing for that landscape, right? Because, you know, I mean, that's why we knew we had to take out those fountains and make the landscape healing and put, you know, something that would capture and clean the water. You know, landscapes can be healing. You know, they can make a difference in communities and help us deal with this crazy stuff that happens. Thank you. So we do have time for some questions. Um, I could try the microphone again. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm curious, you talked a lot about community engagement and getting the right diverse groups of speakers and people that are really relevant to uh, the project. And um, I noticed uh, uh, in New Orleans, obviously, you had like direct connections and you probably understood those folks. Um, I work on a lot of projects that are further afloat from the locale of my practice. And um, I'm curious what steps you take to ensure that you are getting the right voices when you don't necessarily know the community personally? Some of the students, for sure. Questions from the students. So uh, thank you for your talk. But at the beginning of your presentation, you talked a little bit of about like gentrification versus displacement. And I know that's like they go hand in hand a lot of the times. And so how going into these projects, how do you sort of take these sort of measures to make sure that afterwards 
that this sort of gentrification process doesn't happen and like that community stays intact and isn't displaced because of this sort of renewal that you create into this area. It doesn't raise sort of like the prices around them. It doesn't raise rents and things like that around them. So what's that? I know it's like a, I don't know if this, it's a hard sort of question to deal with, but like to a topic, I guess, to, to make sure it doesn't happen. So I guess, what are some measures that you sort of take to sort of deal with this kind of thing? Yeah, so I, I, I didn't mean to say if I said it, because I'm not going to contradict you, gentrification versus displacement. Displacement office often is one of the many components of gentrification, because gentrification often includes revitalization. It might include displacement. It might include, often it's displacement by some of the same group that have higher economic, you know, yeah, so it's a component. You're very right, it's very layered. So I think what you have to do, you have to do work before that, because there are many things you can do, right? You know, there was a project where we we're going to do this park, and we knew there was going to be green gentrification, because parks tend to raise property values, right? Because, um, so there are many things that you could do. First of all, you have to think that design is, is connected to I'm going to say it because you were at the table saying you didn't want to deal with politics. But design is connected to politics. You cannot get over it. And the sooner we embrace it, the more powerful we become to realize that, OK, I'm doing this park, but I need to talk to the housing authority right, about how we can deal with maybe having affordable housing. Or I need to talk to the city and the state to see if we can grandfather in the tax rates. We did this in Baltimore so that people that live there, they, their, their tax rate wouldn't go up, right? Their property tax wouldn't go up because the property taxes go up because you put in all the new development and somebody that have their houses, their prop, you know? So you do that. I'm gonna bring in the school system, right? To make sure that, you know, this elementary school and these kids that are serviced by this community can still use this park and this still, you know? So you have to think that, you have to really realize all those components that are gonna impact who gets to stay, who has a piece of it, right? All those things, you know, housing, taxes, education, you know, and bring those into the engagement. Talk to the client and say, okay, we must bring and get them to understand that. And often you have good clients that say, we should, we should do that, yeah. Because if you just think, okay, I'm gonna do the design and, and, and do that over here, yeah, it, it, yeah. You kind of done, you've lost your, you know, because you can't really, you know, you were the designer, right? You can't deal with that. But if you make that, those, those part of your design, you know, process, yeah, then you can. Good question. <laughs> so I have one. So you're building consensus a lot of these projects, and that takes time, it takes trust, it takes relationships. If a process like this for Mayor Rice Memorial or the even the, the, the highway project, um, how much time in, in the project do you give towards this public? Before you actually get into the more specifics of design. Yeah, so I would really say, okay, so Claiborne Corridor, I would really say that project kind of started to happen 2017, but it actually probably goes back to 2013 when we did that first. Even if you say 2017, we're at 2023. <laughs> And it's just going to bid, right? And you could see that engagement that Colagate did, that was, you know, um, part of this project. You know, they were the engagement consultant, and then they put it out to bid. We were the design consultant. Um, us and we, we teamed with an engineering firm called Myers Engineering. Um, that process was like a year and a half, just the engagement, because he did it a year and he did it over the summer. But it was worth it, right? Because then they had an engagement report, 
which is really great to have an engagement report and an agreement to say that the things that come out of this engagement, when they put out the RFP, these are these. This is what you have to address, and this came this came from the community, right? So engagement does take some time. I mean, especially like that public housing project. That was about a year because we came and went, right? You can't just do one, right? So we came and we walked around with them, then we left and we did those three <laughs> designs and then we came back and we had them give us feedback and then we went away and we did the one and then we came back, right? <laughs> so it takes time, but it's worth it because then when you're finished, you know, people, not only they like it, they steward it. Because this is the thing. Um, if you're an architect or a landscape architect, it is quite different than being an, a fine artist. I tell my students that, right? And the difference is, I have a BFA, so I know, and I still paint. So when I paint, I do hope that somebody will pay a million dollars for it, but when I paint, I'm painting for me, because I don't know who's gonna buy it or who's not gonna buy it, and most of the time, nobody's buying my work anyway. But, <laughs> but um, I paint for me. But when you design, we're each unique, and so the forms come out differently, and we have different ways of processing and thinking, but we're designing for somebody else. Because when I finish, you know, I'm not living in Cleveland, and I've gone back to the Tamir Rice Memorial, but I'm not the one walking through it every day. That community is, and actually the community there, someone was telling me how, um, and they talk about this in the article, that when they were there, that somebody was walking and they said, oh, be careful, don't walk over the stone, or the community actually is taking care of the rain garden. You wanna make stewards, and just like us, I only care about something that I'm, I have, you know, I have a stake, I have some input in. So community engagement might take a long time, you know, if you do it right, because the idea really is not about the design as much as the aftermath because I'm gonna walk away. I'm going to the next project, right? I did it for them. Even though, you know, we got egos as designers and you can say, look what I did, but I'm going somewhere else to the next project. That community's left with it. And if they don't feel like you listen to them, it's what they want, you'll come back. And I've seen this on my own projects, graffiti, things pulled out, holes in fences, trees torn down. If they love it, if they feel like it's theirs, they'll steward it. They'll make sure that if the city's supposed to maintain it, they'll call the city, they'll do stuff themselves. That's the point of community engagement to me. It's about stewardship because I can't steward every project that I do and my ego wants my projects to stay and look beautiful. So I <laughs> do community engagement because I wanna hand it over to somebody else, the community, to love it and take care of it. And I know that's only gonna happen if they feel that they were heard and they got what they want and can care about. So that's why community engagement, it's worth the coming back and forth, it's worth the months or year or whatever you have to do um, if you want your work to last and be cared about. Because, you know, we go on to the next thing. It's not like my painting that's hanging up in my house and I get to look at it and dust it off every day. <laughs> you know, my God, I'm not there. I can't do that. So I have to count on the community to do it for me.